You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. The listener, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. If I sound a little bit different, it's because we're not coming to you from our studio in Chicago. No, we're coming to you live from the Options Industry Conference here in the scenic and sunny Florida. A lot of great guests lined up for you, so stay tuned to the network over the coming week or so because a lot of great content heading your way. And next up on the old network is a newcomer to the network and indeed to the program. He is Patrick McCreary, the executive director over there at Volant. Patrick, welcome to the program. Thank you. And as we are wont to do with all of our first timers, Patrick, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the space and then what the heck it is you guys do over there at Volant. So uh, I'm a software engineer. I started off at Goldman Sachs working on their uh, execution services business. I'm not familiar with them. Who? <laughs> and uh, after a few years there and a few other changes in um, my career path, I eventually landed at uh, Volant Trading. And from there, I built the execution services business from the ground up. Uh, that was about seven years ago. And um, now we're, uh, we've are we been live for six years and have um, a list of clients and a lot of business going on. We're looking at expanding. So let's talk about that business. I'm sure a lot of our audience is not familiar with Volant and what it is you guys do. So basic elevator pitch. What is it you guys do? So we specialize in making uh, highly customized offerings for our clients where we can get them a combination of uh, best execution, um, fee, at, uh, fee minimization, or liquidity acquisition based on their needs and their, uh, their routing uh, desires. So we customize that and <clears throat> um, fine tune it for each client's individual needs. So do you specialize in certain market segments? I mean, the name implies a certain, uh, certain bit of volatility there. Do you guys play in that space, or is it just a, a cool-sounding name? Uh, that's our market maker. So the main business for the firm is market making, um, and they make markets on all the OCC uh, listed options exchanges and um, also some futures exchanges. So the execution services business kind of dovetails into that a bit where for certain clients that are interested in it, we have the ability to expose their order flow to our market maker for internalization purposes. And right now, who are the who are the early users of your execution services? Are they focusing? And like I said, are they pretty much leaning into uh, the market making arm, or are they charting? I mean, we have people come in here from different firms uh, talking about you know execution and trading things in, in a wide array. I was talking to someone just recently talking about how their clients like to just chase vol, and they don't care where it is. It could be in equities, it could be in ags, it could be in dairy. You know, it could be wherever the vol is. They want to go. So, is there a certain asset class or segment your clients are really focusing on right now, or are they kind of all of the above? It's actually all over the place. Um, we mainly have clients that are, we have clients in, across all types of um, backgrounds from like hedge funds to retail trading websites and other broker dealers that are aggregating a, a wide gamut of client types as well. So we honestly have a little bit of everything and um, have adapted our system to handle all of it. So what is it that brings you down to OIC this year? Do you have, uh, is, it, is it time for some announcements? Or are you kind of just here to just catch up with your end users and maybe find some new clients? What is it that brings you to, outside of the weather, what's it, what brings you to sunny, sunny <laughs> Miami here? Yeah, we, uh, we come down here about for the last three years, and it's usually a combination of getting kind of a pulse on what's going on in the industry, um, meeting up with some of our strategic partners, looking for new ones, 
and um, you know, talking to potential clients and existing clients and just kind of syncing up with everyone that's in the industry. Uh, there is a lot of syncing going on, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> you know, you obviously, you, you focus, you come from a, a software engineering background, so obviously the technology side is an interesting focus. And there's, that kind of intersection is, is uh, in focus a lot at a conference like this where we see uh, the technology and the needs to connect to, let's say, myriad and disparate venues is coming into contact with the, the issues for, let's say, the other half of your firm, the other side of your firm there, which is the market-making liquidity providing side where they're having to deal with all this technology to connect to all these different venues. We're up to, what is it, 16 now, uh, different exchanges now, which is just a, a, a large amount. Let's just, let's just put it that way. Uh, I'm curious for you, uh, from a technology, technology perspective, uh, also obviously from a vendor perspective, uh, that sort of fragmentation provides a lot of opportunities. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, you guys come from a core of liquidity providing side of the space, and uh, that obviously poses a lot of challenges there. So I'm curious for you, you kind of maybe, maybe you walk the line between the two. Where do, you, where do you fall on this proliferation of venues and maybe the, the, the onus it puts on liquidity providers and indeed on technology providers to maybe to be able to, to deal with all these disparate array of trading venues? Yeah, I think you put it pretty well in the sense that there's both a... Um a uh, problem here as well as uh, an opportunity, depending on which side you fall on. So on the market-making side, they definitely struggle with being able to make all the names, all the strikes across all the exchanges, and um, you know managing the technology infrastructure to support that. Uh, on the execution side, um, we have similar challenges, but I would definitely say we have a lot more opportunities because um, as this happens, as, as things proliferate like this, uh, we are given the opportunity to kind of manage a lot of this headache that um, people would have to deal with otherwise. So uh, we normalize a lot of the infrastructure that's going into connecting to the exchanges and getting all their fee files and tracking all this information that clients need to track and report to their clients or to manage their own billing infrastructure. And that becomes kind of um, a, an opportunistic thing where we can go in there and say, hey, we're going to take care of all this for you. And um, you know, you don't have to worry about it as much. So you do wear a couple of interesting hats there because you're right. On the one hand, on the core business, it's a huge problem, <laughs> and yet for your sliver of the business, it is an enormous. It's pretty much, I would have to say, that one of the reasons you guys probably exist is to navigate this uh, this very nuanced ecosystem. So I wonder, and it's, it's a little bit, little bit of a uh, little bit of dual purposes going on there, which is, I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it is, and it's. Um it's it's more, it's almost necessary to do it now to kind of differentiate as an execution services business because it's been fairly commoditized to the point where you're not really um, innovating too much on um, you know smart routing algos and stuff. It's more going to be creating a, a very good user experience and service offering for the client. Actually, put on the put on the hat from the core market making crew just for a second because one of the other topics uh, we've been talking about a lot here at the conference and it comes up every year is the issue of, you know, what's going on in your space, which is effectively, you know, we've seen fewer and fewer liquidity providers over the years. There's not many firms really getting into that space anymore, so it's become a very, very, uh, very targeted, siloed, small group of, group of firms that are really providing a lot of liquidity uh, out there. So there's a lot of talk every year about what we can do as an industry to maybe maybe reverse that trend, maybe try to uh, incentivize you guys and maybe, in, I don't want to bring you new competitors, but maybe incentivize <laughs> new firms to come into the space and maybe lift some of that liquidity burden. So I'm curious, what do you think as an industry, what do you think we should be focusing on? What can we do to really make it a little easier to be a market maker and a liquidity provider in 2019? Yeah, I mean, that's a very complicated question. I think that there's some nature of the way the market making is structured right now with the auction mechanisms being able to um, effectively disincentivize people to quote that have access to a lot of captive retail flow in their execution services arm that they're going to internalize with their market maker. So um, that kind of um, reduces the ability for a lot of people to get access to good liquidity in the market. So when market makers that um, don't have these execution services arms uh, try to quote on the screens, they're just going to get picked off in uh, a lot of scenarios and not really get a chance to interact with the good opportunity, uh, good trades that are available out there. Um, and then when they do try to step into the auction mechanisms, there's uh, uh, disincentivized, uh, they're disincentivized through the pricing mechanisms um, that are involved in the breakups um, from trying to trade against that retail flow. So that's, one of the things that I've seen that I think kind of uh, impacts market uh, market makers, and then the other is just like the the 
prohibitive cost for them to get into this business and quoting all the exchanges, meeting all the requirements, um, you know, keeping their uh, quoting and compliance, um, all the technology that goes around between um, making sure that they're meeting all the quoting obligations to making sure that they're not sending too many messages. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff on the compliance side as well that um, adds into this. Uh, let alone the technology of just maintaining the infrastructure for market making. So maybe even though you're in, you're in the industry, you're maybe advocating for lowering that the barriers to entry a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I think that could help. Um, I mean, maybe there's maybe there's an opportunity there as well for uh, someone to come up with some sort of um, vendor platform that would allow like a market making in a box. Um, where they can get access through the exchanges. But I, I think um, the reality is that the, there's a lot of different factors that have just made it very difficult for people to get in. And um, until some of these things changes, whether it's the cost or some of the um, the mechanisms that are on the exchanges that are kind of reducing the ability for people to interact with good flow, um, we're probably going to be in this state uh, going forward. Let's talk about interacting with good flow. That's the challenge for a guy like you. Obviously, you're out there trying to find all, all that good flow and put it up in the right spots. And one of the interesting things that comes up at a conference like this a lot is the issue of auctions. You know, it's kind of a divisive issue. On the one hand, people say, hey, look, it's a nice, great, tight advertisement for our business. It's three cents wide, you know. But then you say, oh, it's only two by one, you know. And so is that, is that, really, is that really a good advertisement or not? I don't know. So it seems like there's, there are definitely two sides to that. I'm curious. You guys obviously spend a lot of your time finding ways to execute for your clients. What are your thoughts on the, on the proliferation of auctions? Seems like every venue has an offering like that now. And whether they're, you know, at the, at the end, are they a good thing because they're showing nice tight markets? Or is it more the fact that they're disguising the, the true liquidity in the marketplace? Yeah, it's interesting because they do disguise, I think, the, at least the quote that you could have. Uh, where, where are the options actually being priced at to a certain degree? Um, they do kind of um, give the illusion of price improvement. So when you go out there and the market's a dollar by $2, um, you're now getting you know 20% of price improvement or 40% of price improvement. So it, it looks like a good statistic on one end, but on the other end, that market probably should have been quoting at like $1.30 by $1.70 instead. Um, so while you you get this kind of false sense of price improvement, you're, you're, um, you're, you're actually trading in what the market should have been if it was actually lit. So the auction mechanisms kind of disincentivize a lot of market makers from um, putting out good quotes. And, you know, if some of the biggest players aren't putting out those quotes and no one else is going to kind of join in and take the chance of being picked off. So now we have ultra-wide quotes and a lot of names as a result. Um, this obviously doesn't affect the really liquid stuff like SPY, though. I like that term, false price improvement. I may have to borrow that from time to time, Patrick. <laughs> so hopefully your licensing fees are uh, are fairly modest. <laughs> but you know, obviously you spend your time obviously navigating these very turbulent, very fragmented waters, uh, you know, it, leaning off the core, you know, market-making firm to kind of provide a lot of execution services. But, you know, is there – we kind of touched on it earlier, but I'm still kind of curious. Uh, is there one area you see right now that you're really focusing on that that's a great – growth area for you guys in terms of there's still a huge demand, a huge need for your execution services? Or maybe there's a new product that a lot of, a lot of firms aren't really playing in yet that you're seeing some clients have some need to take your expertise in, in your traditional areas and maybe apply them to something, let's say, a little bit more esoteric, maybe fluid milk, something fun like that. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, where do you see kind of your growth opportunities coming in the, in the coming you know months and years? I think it's really going to be around navigating just the complexities of the options market like what can we do to achieve their goals if it's a matter of sourcing liquidity for them through alternative means um or is it going to be just navigating the, the the microstructure of the landscape for certain trades that certain clients are trying to put up or is it just providing a maximization of price improvement um that that's really what it kind of boils down to at least staying inside this industry um, outside of that, I think um, creating just a more holistic offering, um, adding and expanding into other areas that make sense with an execution services business would be kind of the next phase or next steps that we would want to look at. So. Well, Patrick, I'm glad we had a chance to kind of catch up and actually have, have Volant on the network for the first time. Seems like uh, 
it seemed like we would have done this earlier, but <laughs> there's a lot of people out there to talk to, Patrick. Yeah. But before we go, we like to give our, give our, our attendees here, our guests, uh, a chance to perhaps uh, share with our audience a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of maybe what they can expect from them in the coming months, maybe of a new announcement you're making here at the conference. So, so what can our listeners look forward to coming to, from you guys in the coming months? Um, I can't really disclose the details yet. It's just but... you and I talking. These microphones are all off. There's no one listening. <laughs> Uh, but um, we will be getting into some new business areas in the upcoming months. Uh, you know, once we get some approvals in place, and um, start with a C, C R Y P T O bank accounts. Uh, no, uh, a little bit more traditional than that. So yeah, but um, yeah, we'll have something interesting coming out soon, and uh, we'll have uh, we have some clients that are friendly that will be starting off with us. Well, we'll look forward to that. Patrick, thank you for joining us, giving our audience a little bit of a glimpse into what you guys do over there. at I've always said Volant, so Volant. That at least, oh, at least yeah. educated me. <laughs> so, and we'll look forward to seeing maybe the, how this new uh, business, uh, how it plays out in the marketplace in the coming months. Great. Thanks for talking to me. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.